Right, episode four. So far this show has been pretty accessible. Sports, school, food. Yeah, people generally have a good idea of what those things are. What should I do for this episode, I wonder? Hmm. I hope you know who St. Edwin is. Did you know that before the time you currently inhabit, some things happened? And that occasionally these things are preserved for posterity? This is called history. And the city that I currently inhabit, Dublin, in the year of our Lord, 2012, actually has a lot of history. A tiny fraction of which I'm going to try to convey to you in this short video. So I think that history kind of sucks when it's presented out of context. So in the interest of not boring you, I'm going to very quickly recap the entire length and breadth of human history up until the High Middle Ages. So now that we're all caught up, the year is 1169, Dublin is a Viking city, having been under Norse control for three centuries. Dermot McMurrah is the King of Leinster, he gets kicked out by a coalition. He goes to England and swears an oath to King Henry II. Henry gives him permission to recruit Norman mercenaries to take back his land, which he does. By 1171, McMurrah is dead and his hired goon Strongbow has successfully taken Dublin for himself and is actually considering crowning himself the King of Leinster. That actually doesn't come to pass, but the important thing is that Viking rule is over and Dublin is now an Anglo-Norman city under the dominion of King Henry II. It's during this period that construction begins on three churches in the ancient Woodkey area. Christ Church in the 1180s, St. Aldwin's in 1190, whom Wikipedia tells me was a Frankish bishop, store that one in your memory banks, I'm sure it'll save your life one day, and St. Patrick's in 1191. All of these buildings are still standing today, so let's have a saunter through Dublin and soak up some of its culture and heritage. In fact, I guess you could say we have our eye on Dublin. First up is Christchurch, definitely the most famous cathedral in Ireland, and that reputation is not undeserved. It took them so long to build this fucker that different architectural trends came and went during its construction. This is best observed within the Chapel of St. Loud, where older parts are in the Romanesque style and later editions are Gothic. Christchurch has some really interesting attractions, one of which is the Tomb of Strongbow himself. Which, you know, I'm certainly not going to deny the dude his final resting place, but I'm kind of surprised that it's this venerated thing. I mean, our problems with colonialism began with this guy. I think he should be used to bring about a sort of national catharsis, like we should be invited to taunt him and wave our independence in his face. Hey, Strongbow, not so alive now, are you? Sitting there all dead like a prick. Another curiosity now to be found in the crypt of Christchurch are the mummified remains of a cat and a rat that someone found in an organ pipe in the 1850s. And of course, like any sane human being, the question they asked themselves was, hmm, how can we monetize this? Dubliners are crack, man, I swear to God. You know, I'm trying to sell my house in Dublin at the moment. Maybe I should nail a rat to my front door like fucking Martin Luther. Speaking of Martin Luther and the Reformation, let's walk two minutes down the road to St. Patrick's. On the outside, this building does sport some really cool architectural features like Gothic arches and flying buttresses. And within it, it houses the absolutely stunning St. Patrick's window. But the building began to suffer after King Henry VIII broke away from Roman Catholicism, establishing the Church of England as an independent institution. Afterwards, it was rechristened as an Anglican church and stripped of its Catholic decorations. It suffered again when it was demoted to a parish church by Edward VI in 1547. In the years to come, the building slipped further and further into decline. By the 19th century, parts of the structure were literally in ruins, and that's when a restoration was carried out by Benjamin Guinness. Of the family Guinness. In 1860, he walked into the cathedral and he said, Jesus, lads, sure we might make a start on this restoration. We have to be out of here by five o'clock today. Okay, no, he didn't say that. Guinness removed a bunch of stuff he didn't like and could do so unchallenged since he was footing 100% of the bill. He tore down the medieval pulpitum and the walls that divided up the church and kept no record of the work, so today we're not sure which parts of the church are medieval and which come from the 1800s. Pretty sad, eh? Yeah, I mean it's still an awesome building, it would just be nice to know which parts to attribute to whom. Still though, let's keep the show on the road and go back up the way we came to St. Edwin's, demonstrating the fact that I planned this tour based on the script and not on practicality, although you never know, I could have gone to St. Edwin's first and switched the order of the two in editing, but I didn't actually because I wrote this entire aside in the script, including the sentence I'm speaking right now. Anyway, this is St. Edwin's, say hello. Unlike Christchurch and St. Patrick's, it was a medieval parish church throughout its existence, making it the only one of its kind in all of Dublin. The structure actually consists of four chapels, each dating from a different century, three of which fell into serious disrepair after the Reformation. Today it functions quite like a museum, and it houses some really neat stuff, like the 9th century Lucky Stone, which brings you luck if you touch it, 
the funerary monument of Baron Port Leicester who commissioned the Port Leicester Chapel, and a genuine medieval baptismal font which is still in use to this day. I'd say out of the three churches we visited today this is my favourite. There's just something very peaceful about this place, especially outside which features one of my favourite views in the entire city. The site of the later neoclassical church, also called St Outerwinds, viewed through the medieval ruins of the Port Leicester Chapel. That brings me to the point I want to finish up on. See, I'm privileged that I get to enjoy these buildings, but I wonder how close St. Outerwinds came to being demolished, or just left to rot entirely. Same for Christchurch and St. Patrick's. If you consider how awful Dublin's local government have been with regards to preserving history, I'd say the odds of them surviving to this day were actually pretty slim. In 1981, Dublin Corporation, now known as Dublin City Council, committed one of the all-time acts of historic vandalism when they destroyed the remains of a Viking settlement in Wood Quay right beside Christchurch. The earliest part of Dublin that could have been enjoyed by generations to come was instead bulldozed to make way for a monstrosity of an office building. If this episode had any purpose, it was to implore all of us to never let something like this happen again. Local councils have often demonstrated that they would rather sacrifice a lot later to have a little now. The Save Wood Key protests may have been a failure, but in other times and places, protests have effectively resisted the recklessness of city councils and preserved historic buildings. As for myself, I'm clearing out of the city now because I don't want to be caught here after 5 o'clock with my expensive lenses. Yeah, these last few seconds aren't too dignified. I'm just glad St. Audwin wasn't around to see my cowardly display. 